us join in singing our gathering hymn, Holy, 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 number 165. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Little correction on the announcements. Uh, two weeks from today, when we worship here again at Kirkabo, uh, we won't have to, uh, as the hymn just uh, said there, early in the morning. It'll be a little bit half, half an hour later than we have been coming to worship. Uh, so we'll be going to a 9:30 worship service two weeks from today. But next week. When we're out at Nora, we will stick with the 9 o'clock for one more Sunday. That's to accommodate the Sunday school that will be coming into classrooms and those on that day. Otherwise, uh, please take note of the announcements, uh, one that also uh, is not in there, and that is free breakfast tomorrow, French toast and sausage here, and uh, that'll start serving at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning until 10.30, so free. Good word there, free. Otherwise, uh, please take note of the announcements in your bulletin. Uh, Ludafis dinner at Nora coming up uh, on the 17th of September. And uh, we will be looking forward with eager expectation to that. Or at least I am. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, any other announcements that should be highlighted today? Okay. Let us then uh, prepare ourselves for worship by confessing our sins and receiving an assurance from God's word that we are forgiven. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors.
Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Amen. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us pray. O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We give our attention now to the reading of God's word. The psalm for today is 138, and we will read it responsibly by verse. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything else. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Our first reading is from Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 6. Now just as God had called Abraham and Sarah and given them many descendants, so now God offers comfort to Zion. God's deliverance will come soon and will never end. The verses read like this. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me and my justice for a light of the, to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish with smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment. And those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever. And my deliverance will never be ended. The second reading is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. In response to God's merciful activity, we are to wish, worship by living holistic, God-pleasing lives. Our values and viewpoints are not molded by the time in which we live, but are transformed by the Spirit's renewing work. God's grace empowers different forms of service among Christians, but all forms of ministry function to build up the body of Christ. And the reading is here. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, you do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Amen. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Alleluia. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. It is recorded in the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on that rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we're just getting into the forerunner marts, I guess, of the next national election. And already we're seeing a lot of uh, polls being taken as to which of the candidates, especially the presidential candidates, are the ones that the people most want. And so in this era of political polls, the question that we hear Jesus asking his disciples in this reading from Matthew's Gospel uh, kind of sounds a bit like what we might hear today on TV and radio. Who do people say that the Son of Man is, Jesus asked. Or we might paraphrase it in more popular terms, uh, what's the popular opinion? about the identity of the Son of Man. And by that phrase, Son of Man, uh, Jesus is referring to himself. You see, that was proper grammatical usage for a first century Jew. For it was believed to be borderline blasphemy to refer to oneself with those words, I am. And that goes back to the time when God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai in the form of a burning bush. And Moses, who was being commissioned by God to go back into Egypt to uh, set the people of Israel free from their bondage, uh, Moses asked uh, God, well, if I go back to the people and they ask me, what's the name of God? You shall say to them, I am who I am. And God went on to say, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So the proper name of God, which people used to think was pronounced as Jehovah, uh, that name means I am. That same name gives the most basic characteristic of God. 
And that is the thing that uh, makes God unique among all the other things in wor the world that claim to be gods. Uh, that unique characteristic of God that is signified by that name is that God exists. That God is real. And in obedience then to the second commandment, which prohibits anybody taking the name of God in vain, uh, the Jewish people held God's name, I am, in such high regard that they wouldn't even refer to themselves with that word. You know, I wish today people would hold the holy name of God in such high regard. Today, the second commandment's prohibition against using God in vain or in a worthless manner uh, has been pretty much ignored in our day and age. We look at uh, something going on, some drama on TV, and a person goes into a room and finds a dead body or some other terrible thing. Oh, what do they name? They name God. Not in prayer, but they just say, oh my God! which would be a good way to use it if it was a prayer. But they're just using it as a meaningless exclamation. So today many people don't think twice about using God's name in a worthless way. But in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry, that wasn't the case. Now Matthew's Gospel that we're reading from today, that was originally written for Jewish Christians. And so Matthew preserves the original terminology that Jesus used when he asked that question so as not to offend his Jewish readers. And so he asked, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? However, Matthew and Luke, which also include this scripture in their uh, um, telling of the gospel, uh, they were not writing for Jewish Christians, they were writing for Gentile Christians. And so they just say, who do the people say that I am when they quote this? So getting back then, I kind of digressed here, but it's a peeve of mine how blatantly people today use the name of God in a worthless way. But getting back to Jesus' question here. So what did the Poles in first century Judaism say about that question? What was the popular understanding there in first century Galilee about Jesus' true identity? Well, according to what the disciples had been hearing, uh, they reported that opinions vary about Jesus. At least in first century Galilee, where Jesus was doing his ministry, uh, Jesus indeed was a mystery man to the populace there. And so they reported, well, some say that you are John the Baptist. And that was a pretty strange answer because by this time, uh, John the Baptist was dead. You see, John had broke, spoken out against the sins of uh, many people, including the royal family, the family of Herod the Great. But because John the Baptist had called Herod's sin into question, John the Baptist had literally lost his head. In other words, he was beheaded by the order of King Herod. So either people hadn't gotten the news yet that John was dead, or they were believing that somehow he had been resurrected from the dead. Now the Bible does inform us that John the Baptist he was the forerunner of the Messiah. That he was the prophet who had been sent by God to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry. However, the general population of that time, they didn't understand John in that way. They didn't see him as the forerunner of the Messiah, even though he had really, very out in the open, told them so. No, to the, most of the people, John was just a very popular preacher who had the guts to speak out against the ungodliness of the time including even those who are, were of the ruling class. Now other people, uh, the disciples reported to Jesus, they believed that Jesus was really Elijah. Now this expectation that Jesus was Elijah, that really wasn't as far-fetched as it might sound at first. 
Now, true, the prophet Elijah had lived and worked in Israel about, four, about 800 years uh, before the birth of Jesus. We can't say that by this time Elijah was dead and gone. You see, Elijah was one of the two Old Testament uh, characters who had been taken into heaven alive. Elijah had never died as we must die. In case you're wondering, that other uh, one that got a free trip to heaven without going through death was Enoch. And this fact that Elijah's transport into heaven was uh, taken, had taken place without dying that became an important part of Israel's expectations for the dawning of the Messianic age. You see, at the very close of the Jewish scriptures, that part of the Bible that we call the Old Testament, uh, there lies this promise, uh, really at the end of the book of Malachi. For God promised through the words of his prophet Malachi, quote, I will send you the prophet Elijah, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. In other words, the Messianic age. And to this day, that promise uh, plays a very important uh, part in Judaism's expectations of the dawning of that Messianic age. You see, one of the main differences between Christianity and Judaism is that the Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah that he is the Christ. They're st still waiting for God to send to them the Messiah. And during each Passover celebration, which takes place about uh, Easter time, uh, at the Seder meal, uh, which is the very important, kind of the culmination of the uh, Passover uh, celebration, it takes place in the home, among the family. And at the table there that is set for that Seder meal, an empty chair is set at that table for Elijah. And at one point in the meal, the youngest child goes over and opens the door to the dining room so that Elijah may come in if he's ready to return. Now we Christians, of course, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he has come to save the world. And further, we believe the words of Jesus when he said, as it is recorded in the 11th chapter of Matthew, that, quote, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John the Baptist, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. So Elijah has come in the person of John the Baptist. He did come to signal the beginning of the Messianic age. So Jesus wasn't John the Baptist. He was not Elijah. He was not Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And through the words of the New Testament, the mystery about Jesus' identity is solved. Yes, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one whom God has sent to save people like you and me. But you know, in the hearts and minds of many people, even those uh, they call themselves Christians, it seems that that mystery about Jesus' true identity still remains. Who is he? Was he just a good example of, of godly living, of morality? Or was he a prophet like one of the prophets of the Old Testament? You see, each of us has to personally come to grips with that same question that Jesus directed to his original disciples that day, at Caesarea Philippi. Each of us must come to grips with that question, who do you say that I am, Jesus asks. And we're not to think of this as being some sort of a religious quiz show where God puts us on the spot. For wonder of wonders, not, not only does God pose the question, God also allows us to give the right answer. As Jesus said to Peter that day after he had given the correct answer that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Jesus said to Peter, God has given you that right answer. 
It was the grace of God that allowed that uneducated fisherman named Peter to grasp an insight which had uh, eluded everybody else at that time. So the mystery of Jesus' true identity, you see, it's not solved by human intelligence. The mystery of Jesus' true identity is given by God's Spirit working in the life of the believer. And it's been working that same way ever since that day when Peter got the right answer there at Caesarea Philippi. Thinking back to our catechism days. You might remember that in his small catechism, uh, Martin Luther, I think, gave the most uh, clearest and most succinct statement of this truth that when he wrote the explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. For there in that explanation that hopefully a lot of us had to memorize when we were in confirmation instruction, Luther began that explanation about the Spirit's work with these tremendous words. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and preserved me in the true faith. What a tremendous insight that is, that faith in Jesus Christ is not my work, it's God's work within me. God's spirit is what allows me to give the right answer when I'm confronted with that question about who Jesus really is in my life. Now, I would hazard a guess that uh, Luther was probably thinking about this passage from Matthew and uh, the other Gospels that also have it, that that might very well have inspired Luther to write these words of explanation about how God allows us to believe in God. It was not flesh and blood. In other words, it was not Peter or somebody else who might have taught Peter uh, it was that not any human being that allowed him, Peter to give the insight into the true identity of Jesus. Well, the question then arises, uh, but if it is God who brings us to true faith in Jesus, then why doesn't everybody believe? The answer to that, uh, I think, lies in the understanding of those tools that the Holy Spirit uses in order to bring people to faith. Basically, the Holy Spirit's most effective tool to bring people to faith in God is God's holy word. A word that comes to us in a variety of ways. Now, first and foremost, that word is Jesus Christ, God's living word, God's word in human flesh. It was that living word who brought G Peter to have faith, faith enough to confess that you are the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of the living God. Faith brought forth by the Spirit of the living God enabled Peter to see that Jesus wasn't John the Baptist. He wasn't Elijah. He was not Jeremiah or anybody else. He was only the Savior of the world. God's gift of faith allowed Peter to solve the mystery of who Jesus really is. And that same God-given faith, be assured, will do the same for us. We, of course, today don't have the privilege that Peter had and his fellow disciples had that day. We do not have the privilege of being with God's living word in the flesh. Or do we? For later on in our worship service this morning, we will receive the body and blood of our Lord, in, with, and under the bread and wine of Holy Communion. So yes, God's Holy Spirit is still working to bring people to faith using his tools, that is, word and sacrament. The word of God is still present for those who will give attention to it. There is God's written word, the Bible, and it's available to everybody these days. How sad it is that the Bible is so often ignored and unused and neglected. Here is a book that people uh, in the past would have regarded as being a rare treasure to be able to possess it. 
and they would sacrifice much in order to possess it and use it. But in our world, because the Bible is so readily available, it's too often thought of as being of little or no worth. And God's faith-giving word also comes to us through human lips. As I pray that God is enabling to happen through me here this morning. So we are to come to church. Not to be entertained. Not just to meet our friends. But we are to come to church only to be strengthened in our faith. Strengthened through God's faith strengthening word. But you see, when people stay away from the church, stay away from the word and the sacraments that are given in the ch- fellowship of the church, then the Spirit can't use those tools to bring us to a deeper faith in God. So the question keeps on coming to us from the one who is a mystery to those who have isolated themselves from God's word. Jesus still asks, but who do you say that I am? May we always give the right answer. Yes, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Amen. Our hymn of the day, Holy God, we praise your name, number 535. And during that singing, we will receive the morning's offering.
Let us confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and our concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, for those who are in need, and for all of creation. God of Sarah and Abraham, inspire your church to pursue righteousness in its ministry. Equip us to share your compassion that unites us as one family of faith. Hear us, O God. Remind us that from the beginning of creation, you knit together a world that is meant for harmony. Protect and restore the wasted places. Restore them to joy and gladness. Hear us, O God. Stir the leaders of nations and of towns militaries and courts. Stir them to respond to your teaching. Let your call for justice reach all people and bring deliverance where there is oppression. Hear us, O God. Show your steadfast love and faithfulness to those who are in despair. Increase their strength. Care for all who are feeling low. Keep safe any who are in the midst of trouble and protect vulnerable people from harm. Hear us, O God. Encourage those who offer their gifts and talents in service to your church. Energize our parish leaders, musicians, teachers, so that they may be transformed in the sharing of your grace with others. Hear us, O God. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, 
we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that by this holy communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him, with him, in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. All people are called to Christ's table. Come, eat what is good. Please be seated. given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The God who calls us through the gospel and crawls us across the cosmos speaks to us in the smallest seed Bless, keep, and sustain us now and to the end of the age. Amen. Our closing hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal. 